At the end of World War I, the Congress, in its ultimate wisdom, I say that in quotes, decided there was no further use for the airplane. So they sold them all. That's where people like Charles Lindbergh and the Barnstormers got their jennies. They bought the war surplus from the United States government. And as far as the President of the United States at that time was concerned, he thought maybe they just ought to buy one airplane and take turns flying it. <laughs> Reminds me of the way we treat the space program today, but I'm not going into that. That's for another story for another time. But all of those guys coming home from World War I who got infected by the flying bug and wanted to go out and see what they could do with it were private individuals. They were entrepreneurs. They were people who decided that, well, I can do it. It doesn't take much. I'll build my own. Or I'll buy one surplus and I'll go fly it and I'll show other people what it's like to fly. And one of these days there might be a future in this. That was not the government's attitude. The government felt that it gotten all out, out of the airplane that was what we were going to get. And that there would be no future and no tomorrow for the airplane. Well, other people saw it differently. Rascals and their flying machines. The rascals were those great individuals who went out and decided to do it on their own. If I were being technically correct, I would say that the first military aviator was not in World War I, he was in the Civil War. This is Thaddeus S. C. Stevens. He was a balloonist, and he could have been the model for L. Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz because he flew his balloon at county fairs and other exhibitions. He took people for rides in it and so forth. When the Civil War came along, he volunteered his balloon and went to work observing the enemy lines from his balloon and telegraphing, telegraph key and wire, what he saw to the ground from his balloon. So, he obviously was the first military aviator in technical terms. It was a helium balloon, and he had a small crew, and they worked the lines, and they did a service for the entire length of the war. How about them apples? <laughs> rascals, rascals. Keep in mind what rascals we're talking about, like this one. That's Wilbur Wright. Wilbur was born in 1867, two years after the Civil War was over. His brother, Orville, was born in 1871. They were entrepreneurs from the time they were old enough to go around and pick up junk in the alley. These kids built their own printing press. Actually did. Built their own printing press and ran their own newspaper in the neighborhood there in Dayton. And actually sold advertising. That's the kind of rascals they were. They always had that mechanical aptitude about them. They are always curious about things. And they got into the bicycle business simply because it was a fad and they knew they could cash in on it. So they decided to build bicycles. And they did. In their own little shop there in Dayton, they had a nice little machine shop. They built and sold bicycles and bicycle parts. But they had always been interested in the birds and things that fly. And they were reading everything they could lay their hands on about what people all over the world were doing. There was a turn right at that time. There was momentum for things that fly. There were people experimenting. Some were in Germany, France, a few in the United States. And they were reading everything they could lay their hands on. And they were dreaming about how it could be done. They flew kites. They believed that uh, if you could learn to fly a kite and you could control it from the ground, you had the beginnings of designing a machine large enough to carry a person. But first, you, uh, they understood you had to have control. And control is probably one of the premier things they did. Building a way to control a machine in flight and finding a way to power it so it would fly. 
These boys wanted to fly circles. They wanted to go someplace. Most of the people who were experimenting were simply trying to just get something that would fly in a straight line. And that's where the difference comes in. Different minds. They were interesting. They could have been twins. Of course, they weren't, but they could have been twins. They had a way of deciding how things worked and how to work out things. They would each take a side of the issue, and they would argue their side of the issue, and then they would change sides. And that's how they came down and ground the problem down to its, its nib. Uh, original thinkers, neither one got farther than high school. Uh, but boy, they must have taught physics in those days. I'll tell you, they must have taught physics. But there were still all the doubters. Lord Kelvin, the head of the Royal Society of Engineering, said that in 1895 that heavier than air flying machines are impossible. All these people were experimenting. That was his declaration, and he had authority. Well, Orville said that he thought he'd like to build an automobile in 1895. And Wilbur said, no, it'd be easier to build a flying machine. They both decided that what they would do is design a way to catch falling parts off the automobiles at Irving. They just string a sheet off of all four axles and catch the parts as they fell. Never married. They both agreed that no man could afford an airplane and a wife at the same time. <laughs> a lot of people disproved that today, but they were probably pretty right. Charles Duell, the Commissioner of Patents in 1899, declared officially in a speech that everything that can be invented has been invented. <laughs> he didn't know what was going on in Dayton. <laughs> Coming back from the glider trials in 1901 at Kitty Hawk, they had really gotten into it seriously by that time, building gliders that they could throw off hill level hill and, and glide down in. Pretty discouraging sometimes, and Wilbur moaned that man will never fly in a thousand years. Yet, on December 17, 1903, at 10.35 in the morning, against a 20 mile an hour wind, they flew. That's Orville at the controls. That's Wilbur, who has just held up that wingtip as it raced down that little rail you see there. There's a trolley that it sat on. It has just lifted off, and a Coast Guardsman by the camera was told, as soon as the airplane rises, you should take a picture. And this is an immortal picture. On that flight, he flew 120 feet, which is roughly the span of the tail plane of a 747. <laughs> it was up and down, like this. You notice how far he's got the elevator pulled up? Well, that, that was, he was climbing too steeply. He said that the elevator was balanced too closely in the middle. It should have been a little bit different. They changed that later on and straightened it out. They flew four times that day. The last one was almost a minute, and it went about 900 feet. And they had brought it back. And being practical jokers, they were. Those stern faces, don't let them kid you. They were practical jokers. They were planning after lunch to fly it over Kitty Hawk and scare the bejeebers out of the people <laughs> on the beach. But a wind picked up the airplane, rolled it into a ball with one of them in it. And that ended the flying season for 1903. So they decided, quit while we're ahead before one of us gets killed. And they sent this telegram home to their father, Bishop Wright, in Dayton. Success, four flights Thursday morning, all against a 20 mile wind. Started from level with engine power alone, average speed through the air, 31 miles, longest 59 seconds, informed press, home Christmas, Orville Wright. And that's the way the telegrapher spelled Orville's name. 
Bishop Wright took the telegram down to the local newspaper editor, handed him that, what do you think of that? And the boys were notorious in Dayton. Uh, it was a small town, everybody knew them. And the editor looked at it and said to Bishop Wright, oh, isn't that nice? The boys will be home for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was it. Nobody would believe it. Nobody would believe it. And that was okay because they wanted to get their patent rights. And they started working on the patents right away. What they did was they kind of patented a machine that was able to take off at a known altitude under its own power and under control and fly under control for a distance and land at a point the same altitude as the point of departure. And that is the definition of flight. Okay? You hopped off one spot, you flew under your own control, you landed at another spot, same altitude, you have done it. You have flown. Well, they had their competition. This is Charles Manley, who thought he was a pilot. And this is the head of the Smithsonian Institution. And my, there goes my, uh, there goes my mind. <laughs> yes, Samuel Langley. I knew that. I used to live right down the road from him. But anyway, they had tried to fly Langley's machine, oh, four or five days ahead of the Wrights. And uh, it ended up just going to the end of a platform on a, on a houseboat in the Potomac River and splat straight into the, uh, the uh, water. They didn't have anything right. The airplane didn't have the right shaped wings. The Wright brothers had built their own wind tunnel and had studied the, the shape of wings. They did over 200 different shapes. They didn't know that the propeller is actually a wing and their, their propeller wasn't designed that way. So all in all, it was a total failure. And uh, Langley became a thorn in their side a little bit later on. I'll tell you about that in a minute or two. But here's a guy that was really serious about it. He saw what the Wrights had done. This is Glenn <coughs> Curtis. Glenn Curtis was a motorcycle builder, but he saw the first airplane and he decided, hey, I like that and he decided to improve upon what the Wrights had done. And instead, of, the Wrights had a way to make the airplane turn. What you do is you, you change the shape of the wing. That's, that's the way it still works today. Ailerons change the shape of the wing, and that way they vary the lift on the wing. Well, the Wrights had a way to twist the wings so that in opposite directions, that would cause the airplane to tilt and to begin a turn. Well, Curtis said, well, that's okay, but what if we just add little extra wings on the, on the wing set so that they can move and the wings will be rigid and that they won't have to twist? That got him in a lot of trouble with the Wright brothers who sued him for patent infringement until it all froze over. But he prevailed and they prevailed and um, went on to be competition for each other, and later on went into partnership. But, interesting thing about all of that is these guys were the first ones to sell them. That's the Wright brothers at Fort Myers when they did the famous trials. Lieutenant Selfridge was killed in that, uh, in that set of trials, but they did win the contract with the government and sold that airplane you see right there for $25,000 to the government under contract. And that was the goal. That made them official. And they went on. Everybody got on the bandwagon at that time. And all the rascals gathered around and started working. What they did is they went out and they organized flying schools. They organized exhibition teams to go to county fairs and so forth and show off the airplane, demonstrate it, get people interested. They went out and they did the stop. None of this with government participation. These were the rascals at work, left alone, doing the job. And boy, did they do it. 
Here's Lincoln Beachy. He was a Curtis guy. See those little extra wings I told you about? That was a Curtis airplane. But you know where he is? He's under the Rainbow Bridge at Niagara Falls, showing off what an airplane can do. I suspect he decided once he'd done that once, he was never going to do it again. <laughs> Because they didn't know too much about thermals and air currents and all that sort of thing. And back down in there is just the worst swirl of wind you could ever expect. And he's flying through it. I'll bet he couldn't get out from under that bridge as, you know, fast enough. But anyway, they did things like this. They're out doing stunts. They're out showing off the airplane to people, making them understand what this was all about. This is... Uh, the glamorous Harriet Quimby. She is a journalist and the first American licensed female pilot. She uh, wrote about adventures. She went to the Wright brothers and took lessons. And in those days, she took 90 minutes of instruction from either Orville or Wilbur. And then you could buy your airplane and take it home. So 90 minutes. <laughs> Today, it takes no, 40 or 50 hours just to solo it, fly it all by yourself. But anyway, she did that and immediately after getting her license signed by Orville Wright, because they could do that then, signed by Orville Wright, not a government official, Orville Wright, which, as far as I'm concerned, is a lot, a lot better than what I've got in my pocket. But anyway, since she did that, she took her airplane to England and flew across the English Channel, setting a record. Came home about a year later, she died uh, giving an exhibition in Boston. She died in the harbor. Okay. She made her contribution. People think that she probably was the model for Amelia Earhart. Okay. This is Ruth Law Oliver racing cars. Sometimes she even beat them. But that's the kind of stuff they were doing. They were going out and pulling it up by the grassroots. Charles Hamilton, one of Curtis's exhibition pilots, said, if we keep this all up, we're all going to die. <laughs> and uh, he died in bed as a very old man. <laughs> Here's my, one of my favorites. This is Calrith Perry Rogers. Cal Rogers. Cal Rogers one took his 90 minutes worth of instruction from Orville Wright, took his airplane, and went out and got in the competition for a prize that was being offered for the first place person who could fly an airplane from New York to Los Angeles in 30 days. Well, he got uh, Charles Armour, a great industrialist and a food processor out of uh, Chicago, to sponsor him. And he put up $23,000, and they got a, a train, and they filled it full of spare parts and crews, and Cal set off with that cigar clamped in his teeth and started following the railroad lines to Los Angeles. He crashed 16 times before he got <laughs> to Pasadena. 16, 16 times. You see that bandage on his, on his, uh, I don't know, yeah, sure. But he became a national hero, of course. It took him 49 days to actually get to the Pacific Ocean, doing it that way. But it didn't matter whether he won the prize or not, he became a national hero. Like an astronaut, these people were looked upon like astronauts, these rascals. He was killed a year later in the surf. Uh, crashed his airplane on the beach near Los Angeles. This is the airplane, by the way. Called, see, it's called the Vin Fizz. Vin Fizz was Armour's soda pop, and he wanted his full share of advertising on the airplane. <laughs> the airplane you see there in that picture, only three parts of it are originals. He crashed 16 times. Come on, folks. <laughs> Give it a break. Great names started to come up. Bill Bowie, up in Seattle building seaplanes. These two guys, that's Donald Douglas as a, as a young man. That's Glenn Martin, who built great seaplanes for the Navy. They were starting to think, how do you build an airplane so that it's stronger, yet it's lighter, 
and we'll go faster. How do you do that? They were starting to work on that. No help from the government, no subsidies, no nothing, just them. Most of them didn't have two nickels to rub against each other. They were out getting loans from people, getting people to sponsor them, but they were out there doing it, these rascals. See these guys? These are the Loghead brothers. They decided it would spell easier if they called themselves Lockheed. <laughs> Captain Eddie, Eddie Rickenbacker, he was a great race car driver. And when World War I came along, he decided he wanted to get involved. He was making $40,000 a year in 1910. But he went and when we got over there, he got attached to Mike Jack Person's staff. And he begged him to assign him to an aviation school, drove him nuts because he was Pershing's driver, and Pershing liked having a famous race driver driving him around in Europe. But he finally relented, and uh, with the help of another guy, uh, a colonel named Billy Mitchell, he got transferred. 29 kills in two months. The Hatton Ring Squadron. He came back, by the way, I'm getting ahead of myself. I've got a story I've got to tell you. Eddie came back and decided that, well, there must be some way to use the airplane for profit. He was a good guy for that. And he was down in, San in Tampa. And about the time the government decided that maybe it ought to have some hand in this, it will pay people to fly airplanes to carry the mail. It'll do a subsidy for people who will carry the mail in airplanes, which, of course, organized an industry and became the basis of the airline industry we have today. The airlines would much rather carry things than they would people even today, by the way. But what Eddie did was because they were getting paid to carry the mail, he started wrapping up bricks and addressing them to himself across Tampa Bay, <laughs> flying them over there, and collecting for delivery of the mail. <laughs> Send himself bricks. And that, my friends, is how Eastern Airlines was born. Okay? That's right. These are rascals. And don't forget, they're rascals. They're trying to make a buck. They're trying to do something they really love, and they think that everybody ought to love it. This is Billy Mitchell, who told the government that it was foolish for deciding airplanes weren't necessary. And as a matter of fact, he made such a case of it that he got himself cashiered and tossed out. Uh, but before he did that, he went out and proved to them the Navy didn't like this a bit. That's the Austrian. Aus huh. Anyway, <laughs> I can't even pronounce the, the German name of the, the battleship, but the point is, he did that with an airplane. He sank it and showed them what air power could do. They still wouldn't listen. You think that they're only politicians on Capitol Hill? No, no. The Navy, the Army, they all have politicians among their ranks. And they squashed Billy Mitchell in the cruelest possible way for telling the truth. Here's a guy who believed Billy Mitchell, the Lone Eagle. He talked about the Neil Armstrong of his day. Here it is. This was an airmail pilot. Uh, who was flying the mail out of St. Louis up to Chicago most every night. Crashed the airplane a couple times, came down in parachutes, picked up the mail bag, and delivered the mail to Chicago by car. <laughs> but he could see what was going to happen, and somebody then offered a prize for the first person who could fly solo to Paris from New York. Up until that time, there had been a couple of crossings, but it was done by people in large airplanes flying in tandem three crews. Uh, Lindbergh was going to do it by himself because number one, he believed that aircraft engines by 1927 had gotten to the point that they were dependable enough to make a trip like that. And they would roar off. You know who made the engines? The Wright Aeronautical Company. Okay. See, it was a pretty small crowd. Everybody knew everybody. But he went ahead, had Spirit of St. Louis built with the help of several St. Louis businessmen. That's the reason it's called the Spirit of St. Louis. 
took off and flew to Paris, the epic 33 and a half hour trip we all know about. Well, I was doing a, a television program for the Air Force. Uh, I, I started my own little business in 1993. And uh, we went to Yale where his papers are and went through his papers. He got in a lot of trouble, you know, because he went to visit the German Air Force and became convinced that they were awfully darn good and that we should not go up against them in World War II. And he made speeches to that effect. It's uh, what isn't known generally, and I discovered this among his papers in Yale, uh, is that uh, U.S. military intelligence set up the trip to the German Air Force. I've got a picture that I could show you that's been cropped. The guy's not in the picture that you generally see, but you've seen pictures of Lindbergh standing talking to a, a German officer. Well, if you saw the whole picture, you would see an American military officer right behind Lindbergh. And he was the military attaché at the, German, at the uh, American embassy in Berlin. He had set up this trip. He, went, he, didn't, he didn't go there at the invitations of the Germans, per se. The guy came to Lindbergh and said they would like for you to see their Air Force, and he went. Well, that followed him for quite a long time, and got him in a lot of trouble with Franklin Roosevelt, who said that uh, just for that, uh, in the speeches he was making, he was not going to be allowed to, uh, to fly in World War II. No way. Wasn't going to get him in the, in the uh, Army. Well, what he did is he went to work for those Lockheed guys, Loghead guys. Went to work because they had just turned out a beautiful airplane called the P-38. Howard Hughes had something to do with that, too. And he went into the Pacific to coach American pilots on how to fly the airplane the most efficiently and with the least fuel. He showed them how to stretch the fuel on the P-38. Now those are two great big contra-rotating engines burn a lot of gas, folks. He told them, he showed them how to lean out the engine so it would fly the best, which made it possible for them to go after Admiral Yamamoto and shoot him down. Uh, because the Japanese thought that Yamamoto's airplane was out of range of American aircraft. They didn't know Lindbergh was on board. And that's how he went. Lindbergh actually took part in a couple of uh, uh, combat missions, shot down a couple of Japanese, or one, at least one Japanese airplane. Came back at the end of the war and served on all kinds of committees with the War Department. He flew American and captured German aircraft in demonstration projects to help the engineers understand more about them. He uh, helped pick out the location for the Air Force Academy. He worked on the Apollo program. And he became a conservationist. All of that, and doing it relatively anonymously. So I met his daughter, and we were having a long conversation. And I finally said, we just don't know your father. He stayed out of, the, out of the public limelight, and we don't know much about him. We don't know what he was like. Uh, I think I've only heard his voice once on a tape. What was he like? Well, he was a great family man. We came home at night. He was not the pilot in Lindbergh. He was daddy. I said, he stayed away from people. She said, yes, he really did not like to be among people. He'd had his he'd gut full of celebrity. And then after his son was kidnapped and killed, that were the captain. But she said, I asked him one time, why won't he go out and see people? And he said, every time they get near me, they want to fly me to Paris. <laughs> All the other things he had done didn't count. They just wanted to fly him to Paris. Neil Armstrong had the same problem. Everybody looked at him, all they could think of was the first man to walk on the moon. Well, it was a pretty big deal, but Neil was a very much deeper person than that. 
and uh, had a lot of things going on the side. He did a lot of, of educational work. Uh, he did a lot of foundations and that sort of thing. But like Lindbergh, he did it very anonymously. I saw him on the street in Washington one day, and I was going to go up to say hello to him, and then I saw the look on his face. He didn't see me yet. And I thought, I'm going to leave him alone. Good for him. Because he was standing there with his overcoat over his arm, glasses on, and waiting for a taxi, and nobody on the street knew it was him. And for him, that must have been wonderful. Okay? Very shy man in many ways. This is Lady Lindbergh, Amelia Earhart. We all know her story. She was a social worker in Boston who suddenly got attracted to airplanes, went out and learned to fly, and history was written from then on. Got in trouble on the trip coming back from around the world and got lost in the Pacific Ocean. Pacific Ocean's a big place. She's trying to push it. She was trying to get home to San Francisco for the 4th of July. And she took a couple of chances that didn't work out. But that's neither here nor there. She made a great contribution. She inspired a lot of young women. And she did a lot of science work with her aircraft uh, while she was doing her record runs and that sort of thing. All of that had a purpose. And most of this kind of stuff had a purpose in those days. It wasn't, just wasn't for prize money and fame. A lot of it had to do with making the airplane a better machine. It was very interesting what was going on. This is the Winnie Mae, named for Winnie Mae Phillips, who is the daughter of the owner of Phillips Petroleum. This airplane was modified six different times in doing the science work that this guy wanted to do. The Wadi Post, another one of those who didn't have a nickel to rub against another nickel. He begged Mr. Phillips to give him that airplane, or at least sponsor him with that airplane. He was Phillips' pilot. He flew, his, flew him around the oil fields. And you know Phillips did it. And he named the airplane the Winnie Mae after Phillips' daughter. You see him there wearing the famous eye patch right there. And he wore that eye patch uh, when he flew because the glass eye would get extremely cold at very high altitudes and give him a severe headache. <laughs> so he didn't wear the glass eye very often at all. <laughs> he memorized uh, distances by walking off distances on the ground and saying, okay, that from here to there is 200 feet. That's how he got his depth perception to be able to land the airplane. He worked it out by rote. I land my airplane, I hope I'm close to the ground when I try to put it down, that's all of us do. But he knew to the inch, and he only had one eye. He wanted to do high altitude work where he could get up to the jet stream and get the jet stream behind you and get speed and really go someplace. To do that, he had to get up about 35,000 feet. This airplane was, mod was modified many different times. It had a big turbo to allow it to fly at those high altitudes. He fixed the landing gear so that when he took off, as soon as he got off the ground, he pulled the handle down here and the gear fell off onto the ground. And there's the airplane streamlined without these, these things dragging in the air and slowing him down. And you see this skid right here? Well, when it was time to land, and then he wheels, time to land, he would come down, get lined up at the runway, click the starter a couple times so that the propeller was horizontal and wouldn't hit the ground, and he landed on his belly on that skid on the grass. The airplane would tip over, get out, put the gear back on, go try it again. This ungainly thing was his spacesuit. He designed it, and he had it made by B.F. Goodrich, and it allowed him to fly at those super high altitudes. And like any astronaut, it furnished water, furnished heat, furnished air, and all the things he needed to survive. It was, as a spacesuit is today, a small spacecraft. Okay? And why they post? <laughs> This oil worker who lost an eye in the oil fields as a teenager 
invented that. And that's the prototype of what we use today. Let's see what else he did. Oh yeah. Blew the Woody May around the, the world twice. Once with this guy, Harold Gay, his navigator, and the second time all by himself. Did it solo. Eight days east is the name of an article I wrote about that one time. You can see the extra fuel tanks. This, I took this picture in the winning. I used to have I used to have a lot of friends at the Smithsonian Institution, so I got to creep around these airplanes at night with my camera. Okay. You can see the extra fuel tanks he had built in there. Back here's where Gaddy sat to navigate, and Post would run a note on a line back to Gaddy. And when he had a question, the note would come back up and tell him what course to set. You didn't want to walk around in this airplane because, like in a boat, if you walked around in the airplane, you changed its balance. And uh, Gaddy sat back here, he had, had the tail balance, okay? If he came up here, the nose would go down because the weight would come out of the tail. It's trim, hitch. So it was primitive. Yeah, it was really primitive. They'd fly all day, land, refuel, sleep, Eat, get up the next morning, fly all day. That's the way they did it. Here he is returning from his solo trip around the world in Cleveland. See the crowd? These guys were heroes. And they were individuals. And they were designing something for the future. They were finding out how to do it. Lord, it was only 66 years between Kitty Hawk and the moon. Look how fast we did. Look how fast it moved once it got started. Things people had dreamed about since people first walked out of a cave and looked at the stars. In our lifetime, we saw these things happen. How come we're so lucky? How come it's, we take it so much for granted? I don't know. I've never been able to figure that out. Still thrills the heck out of me. But this is why we don't remember Wiley Post today. There he is. This is Noam Alaska. Recognize that back? Will Rogers. This was taken on before they took off on the, on the fatal trip. They were doing a, a, a run to uh, work out airline routes, and Rogers was a big aviation fan, and he liked Post, and they were big friends, and he said, I'll go along with you, I'll write my column from the airplane. And with a portable typewriter, and uh, that's what he was doing. He was filing from the field, like modern day reporters do today. I've done enough of that. I know how it feels. But that was the last time, right there. Will Rogers, Wiley Post. Interesting thing is, a friend of mine, a man named Garber, who actually designed most of the Air and Space Museum's collections, went out and actually physically got the airplanes to be home there. Uh, he uh, went down after it was, it was known that uh, Post had died to get the one he made for the Smithsonian collection. But I have it shipped back. The interesting thing he discovered when he got to the one he made in its hangar in Oklahoma City was that its license had run out on the day Post died. Mm -hmm. Brought it back to the Smithsonian, cleaned it up. And it's had a place of honor ever since. See that? See that design? Now compare that to the great aircraft of World War II. This is where the foundation for the wonderful machines that we needed was laid. This is a Northrop Alpha, and it was made for only one thing to carry the mail. By that time, hmm, Harry the Bell's getting to be a pretty good business. You could get a seat on this airplane if you agreed to sit on the mailbags. They really didn't care if you got in that airplane or not. There was a window, but they really were more interested in carrying the mail. And that's what this airplane is for. It's very powerful. It's very sleek. It was, if you'll notice, it's a monoplane. 
a low-wing monoplane, unlike those big box kites that they had during World War I, the ones that the Wright brothers built, those were designed on the pattern of a box kite, by the way. But two wings are better than one, right? Well, as soon as they began, remember Donald Douglas and Glenn Martin back there a few pictures ago? They were designing ways to make airplanes stronger, faster, lighter, bigger. And they were designing ways to make one wing do the job and stay attached to the airplane all the time. That is a feat of engineering. That really is a feat of engineering. But what ha happened was people started embracing these things. And it was in the races where knowledge began to build upon knowledge upon knowledge. Let's make it faster. Let's make it more powerful. What can we take off to make it lighter so it will go faster? That's what happened. And that's where the rascals came in. Because they were out there, they were looking for prize money, but at the same time, in order to get the prize money, they had to build a better airplane. This is one of the, one of the guys who did it. His name is Roscoe Turner. Roscoe was quite a guy, quite a character. He won a lot of races and a lot of money, and he was a great publicist. This is Gilmore, his pet lion. When Gilmore was a cub, he rode with Roscoe everywhere he went. He had his own seat in the airplane. And as soon as he got out of the airplane, the photographers wanted to take a picture of Gilmore more than they wanted to take a picture of Roscoe. But that was okay, because that's money in the bank, bud. Here's Roscoe after a big race between London and Australia with Boeing's new contribution to 247. That was the Seminole airliner. Douglas beat Boeing on that one by turning out the DC-3. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, Roscoe proved what a great airplane this was. Take a look at it. Had a standard tire. He designed, he was not in the military, but he designed a military type airplane because he, or a uh, uniform, because he was a pilot. Okay? It was a big deal. So, the hat, the mustache, the riding boots, all of that is all part of the shtick. Now, how many of you in here remember Smiling Jack, the cartoon feature? Oh, come on, you've seen Smiling Jack when you were a kid. <laughs> there he is. There's Smiling Jack. <laughs> Wrong way, Corrigan. Quite a guy. He always wanted to fly his airplane from New York to Ireland. And the government wouldn't let him because they didn't think his airplane could do the job. And they didn't want to put out a Coast Guard ship to monitor his safety across the way. They didn't want to do the weather forecasting for him. And they just thought they really didn't think he could do it. Well, they didn't know much about him. Wrong way had worked for Ryan, had helped build the Spirit of St. Louis, had installed the fuel tanks and the instrument panel. He flew passengers for hire. Uh, he was no dummy, but he looks like somebody out of a 1940 movie. Let's, let's put on a show, right? Mm -hmm. Well, here he is with his airplane. He got up one morning and he said, well, okay, I guess I better go home to California. So I've got the airplane. And he took off and disappeared into a cloud. And the next thing anybody ever heard from Broadway Corrigan was he was in Dublin, Ireland. And he said, I, my, my compass went bad. <laughs> and he ended up in Ireland. Well, he came home with the airplane. He was a big hero. Everybody loved him, a big character. They called him Wrong Way. Uh, and they brought him home on a ship. He did not fly the airplane. Yet. But he's a rascal character. Here's one of the big ones. That's Juan Terry Tripp. In case you don't recognize him, that's Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh walked, worked for Tripp, laying out airline routes, testing airplanes for him, and that sort of thing. But Tripp, wow. Tripp decided he wanted to build an airline, and 
he came from an old clipper ship family. And when he wanted something, he had the money to, to do it. Uh, when he wanted something, for instance, uh, when he wanted to navigate his pilots between Miami and Havana, he had a radio system built that would send out a beam that they could steer by. Never been done before. Juan needed it, so he had it invented. He needed the 707, so he had it invented. He needed that to go across the Atlantic Ocean. He needed another aircraft to go across the Pacific, so he had that built too. And he had the 747 built. This guy was a powerhouse. He was an arm of the State Department. Frank Roosevelt did not like him either. But he had to put up with him because he did things that Frank Roosevelt needed to have done. He took people into places that didn't have hotels. So, okay, he built the Intercontinental Hotel chain. Wherever his airplanes would go, he'd put in a hotel now. When he wanted to fly across the Pacific, he went to the clipper ship logs and found Wake Island because it was a stepping stone across that he needed. It was just in the place he needed. He went and looked it up, found it. So what did he do? He went to Wake Island. He had a landing spot blasted out in the bay. And he transported a hotel to Wake Island, complete with air conditioning. It was prefabricated, it was in the hold of a ship, prefabricated. Juan needed it, Juan got it. <laughs> there he is, remember that face. This is the China Clipper. Juan had that built too, because he wanted to fly people, really important people, across the Pacific Ocean. It took seven days. <coughs> the airplane cost a million dollars to build, it was so big, the engineer could go out in the wing and service the engines in flight. It had two decks. It had a, I'll get to it in a minute. It had a dining room. It had sleeper bunks. And it had two crews in order to make that trip. These guys, before they made that trip, they were only allowed to do it six or seven times a year. Had to have a complete physical examination and they had to be able to rotate while they were flying in the air. And uh, in those days, you did not make up time. You saved fuel, and that's important to the story I'm about to tell you. This is uh, Captain Harry Turner. I met him in the 60s in uh, Washington when he was attending a convention of the Airline Pilots Association. And in those days, as I tell you, the airline captain was king. That's the way Juan Tripp designed it, because Juan Tripp made his airline run like an ocean-going vessel. That's why captains are called captains today. That's why they wear that uniform that you see them wearing. That's Juan Tripp. Well, Captain Turner, being lord of his domain, was in full charge of an aircraft that was to fly to Shanghai, the Anzac Clipper. There were four or five of the Clippers. He decided he wanted to stop off on his way to the airplane that night and see his daughter's piano recital, so he did, which made him 40 minutes late to the airplane. 40 minutes late taking off. No big deal, because the captain did it. Anybody else had done it, they would have been fired on the spot. But no, he had royalty on board that airplane. He had famous movie stars, he had industrialists on that airplane, because that's the kind of people who could afford to ride on that airplane. And uh, he took off from San Francisco Bay and headed west. First stop was Hawaii, and it would take all night, because like I say, he didn't make up time, he saved gas. So he got up about 3,500 feet, and set a course for Hawaii. 16 hours later, He's sitting in the dining room having breakfast, and his radio operator comes running down from up in the cockpit. It was up upstairs. Came running downstairs. Had this panicky look in his eyes. He'd been listening to a radio station in Honolulu. Captain, Captain, the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor. Captain Turner realized. Being 40 minutes late was not such a bad deal. <laughs> he 
because if he had been on time, he would have been landing that big old tub right in the middle of Pearl Harbor at that time. Mm. <clears throat> so he went to his office, got a manila envelope he had been carrying around on the airplane for months, for months, sealed orders, just against this kind of thing. Opened his orders, so what to do, flew down to the big island and took her into the bay. This was going on in Pearl Harbor. He heard the dispatcher telling him on the telephone what was happening there. So he parked it in the bay, the big island, went into the town and got five gallons of lamp black and five gallons of buttermilk, mixed it to make a washable paint, brought it back, and camouflaged the airplane. Turned it black as night. It was the kind of stuff that barn stores used to paint advertising on the airplanes. Could wash off later and paint somebody else on it. So he got all of his passengers off. The FBI came, the King of Siam, the later King of Siam, happened to be one of those passengers. Got them all off, took them away, and he and his crews, two crews, flew back to San Francisco under radio silence for 16 and a half hours, listening to radio stations on the West Coast report Japanese subs off the coast of California. Of course, there were none, but they went to look for them anyway. They were on the way, might as well. Landed in San Francisco, and immediately the FBI took he and his crews uh, into custody and debriefed them, and because they were the first civilians to return from the war zone. And by that time, it was war. And uh, the next day, Pan Am was drafted into the military. And all those flying boats were used in service by the Army and the Navy for the rest of the war. Captain Turner was one of those who flew the Pacific Commandant around. Notice Chester Nimitz. W.T. Halsey, Bull Halsey, and their staffs. He chauffeured them around the Pacific for most of the, of the war in one of the China Clippers. He sent me that when I was writing a story. I called the story 40 Minutes to Pearl, as you like this. He sent me that, which is a page out of his logbook that they all signed as a compliment to him. And I was so shocked when I got it. I, of course, made several copies <laughs> and then wrapped it up and insured it for as much money as I could possibly dig up at the moment and send it back to him. He said, don't you ever do that again. And he was very gracious about it. He didn't think anything about sending that relic to me through the mail. But he was a great guy. And he retired out of 707s, some of long trips, 707s, during the 60s. Quite a this is a person you'll like. This is Jackie Cochran. Jackie Cochran was a famous race pilot during the 30s. She also ran a fabulous cosmetics business and continued to do that even as the war progressed. But she thought that the women ought to have something to say about airplanes during World War II, and she went to the president and said, I want to organize an expeditionary force of women pilots to deliver aircraft to the military, overseas, in the states, from the factories to the bases, and so forth, to relieve the male pilots of that chore so they can get on with what they need to do. And he agreed. The Women's Air Service Pilots, WASPs, was Jackie Cochran's invention, and they served with great, great uh, distinction during World War II. Some of them were so tiny, they had to put wood blocks on the rudder pedals so that their legs could reach the rudder pedals, okay? They were flying these gigantic airplanes, they were B-17s. These, these, these ladies were flying this kind of airplane. B-25s, and the B-29 later on. They flew them, they delivered them. And they took that away from the men. They, they were treated like second-class citizens. Of course, they were given all the cast-off uniforms and so forth from the men. And, uh, but they flew some airplanes. The men didn't even want to fly. And once the, the girls got out and flew them, then the men decided maybe they, they'd better get aboard. B-26 is one of those. 
And uh, I was emceeing a, uh, a meeting or a reunion of the wasps in the 70s in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and it was only in the 70s that Congress got around to recognizing them as true veterans of World War II and, uh, and giving them veterans benefits. It was in the 70s they finally got around to that. But anyway, uh, doing this thing and having a jolly time, and I'd read up on what the women had done and how they trained. I was telling stories about that, and I told one story about one young woman who is out taking flight training with a with a uh, uh, army pilot, and he was in the front cockpit and she was in the back, and uh, all of a sudden he rolled the airplane upside down. Well, her seatbelt wasn't fastened, and she went straight out, and of course. She came down with her parachute, they all wore parachutes. And, you know, he turned around and saw and didn't notice she was gone. He turned around and, and radioed in and says, I've, I've lost my passenger. But anyway, she, she survived it. And so I, I told that story. And I said, is she here tonight? Way back in the back of the room. I said, you come up here. So she, she came up. And I, we, I interviewed her for a couple of minutes, and I said, what did you think when the airplane turned upside down and left you? She said, I was thrilled. <laughs> I always wanted to jump with a parachute. That's the kind of girls, the rascals, they were. This is Jackie, an old friend of hers, maybe more than a friend. Her name is Chuck Yeager. But Jackie's in the airplane. She's in the F-86. She won several records with that. She wanted to be an astronaut, but that wasn't politically correct. They would not hire her. They only wanted macho men test pilots. They got the best, no question about that. But it wouldn't have hurt to hire her either, because she was the best too. Uh, later on, women did come into the Space Corps uh, and, and made great contributions even as pilots, and uh, you can't take that away. But at that time, it just wasn't being done. Old Chuckles there uh, didn't much think anything about the space program either. Uh, he, he called the astronauts spam in a can, uh, <laughs> but uh, he was wrong. But he's been wrong about a lot of things, didn't he? <laughs> but anyway, they honored Jackie with a postage stamp, and I think that's nice. Jimmy Doolittle, see the shape of the airplane? See what's going on? Racing. Jimmy uh, was the only one of these people who had a PhD from MIT. He invented a gadget that allowed him to fly that airplane without being able to see outside the cockpit. First time instrument flying had ever been done, Jimmy Doolittle did it. This is what we remember him most for, B-25s. The attack on Tokyo from the deck of an aircraft carrier. He really didn't think they could do it, but they did. They were in rough seas when they took off, and they would wait until the bow of the ship tossed up, and that's when they wanted their airplane to be rising off the tip of the, of the ship to give it that little extra push. He thought it was a failure because he was supposed to deliver those airplanes to the Chinese after they flew over Tokyo drop their bombs, keep on going, land in China, turn on the airplanes. Most of them crashed, two of them ended up in Russia. That's why the Russians have an airplane that strongly resembles the B-25. They did things like that. But there he is when he was head of the 8th Air Force in Europe during World War II. He would have loved that thing. That's a hook. And the guy that flew it hung on a wire hung over the side of a destroyer, and he would fly off that wire, go and inspect an island in the Pacific, come back, and he would hook onto that wire and land on it again. Mm -hmm. Very radical. That's the kind of rascals they were. I don't know who this guy is, but I think he's nuts. <laughs> but yeah, he's a rascal too. What he's doing, he's starting his engine. He's reaching out. Flip the prop and start the engine. I think it was a stunt. I hope it was a stunt. This is one of my heroes. 
And he was a rascal, but he got to the point where he had subsidy. During the late 30s, Fred Weick worked for the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. He did things like invent the talons around those engines that made them cool better <coughs> and fly through the air better. Uh, he designed several wings. And then he was given the assignment of designing an airplane that would not spin or stall because people were coming around, lining up with the runway, and were making mistakes, and they were spinning out and killing themselves because when you make that final turn to run, you're only 500 feet in the air, and there's no time to recover from spin. So he was given the task of designing an airplane that wouldn't do that because knowing that there are going to be a lot of amateur pilots around, and what he did was he designed this, which happens to belong to me. That's an air coupe 415C. It will neither stall nor spin. It flies like an MG on a dirt road, and it's more fun than a pistol. <laughs> they used to sell these in, on the showroom floor in Macy's and at Marshall Fields. <laughs> but anyway, it's a neat little airplane, and it's right where we were at the beginning of World War II. It was light, it's fast, I do about 95 miles an hour in it, it's easy to fly, and it will not spin, and it will not stop. And that's probably why I'm standing here today. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you all. Oh. Very much. Thank you. No, I've kept you a long time. Do you have any questions I can answer before we say goodnight? How did they telegraph? You said they, they were in the balloon? Yeah. And they telegraphed. They had a line. Just had a line. Just strung a line down. They threw the line yeah. down. And, That's right. And they had his telegraph key there in the basket with it. And, and, and had, did it get high enough that the bolts wouldn't reach him? He didn't get up about 500 feet, but he was about far enough from the lines they probably couldn't reach him. They probably didn't know what the heck he was. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. But that was the first military aviator, okay. at least in the United States. There's more stories I can tell you, but you don't have all that much time, so mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks a lot. This is great. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you had a Curtis, a Charles Curtis. Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Curtis. Glenn Curtis, right. yeah. And later on, there's a Curtis Wright aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. In the right. They decided right since, since they, they couldn't beat each other, they might as well join. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it was very successful. They, mo they mostly made engines. Uh, he, that was his forte. He was a motorcycle builder, and engines were a big thing for him. That was a motorcycle engine in the airplane. Yeah.